So now we're going to move uh, straight on to the presentations by the chairs and the rapporteurs from the three streams that we had yesterday. I'm just trying to remember who offered to go first. Uh, we, had, uh, we had three streams of course running yesterday. Uh, the Territories of Life, uh, then there was the one facing, uh, working on indicators, and then there was also the one that took the more legal and policy view of things. Uh, Paolo and Helen, Helen, could I ask you to present first? Uh, apology for putting you on the spot. Uh, and, and thanks to both of you for agreeing to take notes and to present the main points back to us. Uh, what the Secretariat is doing, what I'm doing here with Murray Lynn and Sakata, is trying to make sure that if there's any main points that were missed in the declaration, that we include it in the declaration. Also, uh, the drafting committee and anybody else who's interested is welcome to stay back at 12.30 for a short meeting about the process uh, uh, of sending out the declaration as a draft and how we will give you some space to reflect on it and then finalise that electronically and send it to you. Uh, so just to remind the drafting committee, and I think some people, Tora, uh, Paulette, promised to work on some language for us, and we're still waiting on that language. We need it by 12.30. Was there anybody else? Paulette, uh, Tora? I think they were the main people who, they actually gave us some nice language, but it just needed to be refined a little bit. Okay, I'll pass to Helen, thank you. Thank you, John. Can I have it here? Okay, it's gonna to be too high. Can you hear me properly? Okay, good morning. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met previously, you don't know me, my name is Helen Brink, and I work for the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation at the Museum of Natural History. Um, I'm going to report on the session on the nexus of nature, culture, and well-being, which was shared by my colleague Paula Koskas, and who's sitting right there. And uh, I apologize in advance if I sound like I'm short of breath. Um, I'm five months pregnant with a baby that seems very heavy and active right now. <laughs> Okay, so the objectives of the session was to highlight the importance of identifying indicators and approaches to management that connected people, nature, and well-being. The second objective was to raise awareness of the importance of ensuring that linked biological culture approaches inform and contribute to the future work of the Convention, um, on the Convention of Biological Diversity. Um, we had a very rich and interesting discussion which covered quite a broad range of topics. Um, we've done our best to summarize them, um, and we, I will present them briefly here uh, according to common themes that we found. And we're highlighting specific recommendations or actions uh, for the future work of the uh, convention that was raised, and also some of example indicators that came up through the discussions. Um, we will provide more extensive notes from the session to the report. Uh, I think uh, we have until next week to do it, so I invite anyone who is in our session to approach us. We already shared the draft to some of you. Uh, if you want to take a look at it, especially if you're speaking during the session, make sure that your thoughts are reflected. Please let us know and we'll share the draft. Okay, so... Uh, the discussions highlighted that the links between biological and cultural diversity requires global thinking. Uh, but it ultimately requires local action that is based on indigenous and local knowledge resulting from generations of interactions between people and place. This became very clear um, through multiple aspects. And in terms of monitoring and evaluation, uh, speakers expressed that understanding the context for indicators, metrics, and measures, uh, and particularly the links to decision making, is critical. It can't be just monitoring for monitoring's sake. Uh, and they also identified the challenge in, in balancing implications of being required to use indicator sets to demonstrate progress, uh, which, for example, if they're interacting with policymakers or with external actors, or using indicators um, sets as a tool for advocacy uh, and their own non-indigenous engagement. So some of the recommendations and actions that came up was to recognize that there is no such thing as a universally applicable indicators. Where the indicator sets need to accommodate both context-specific and generalizable indicators. 
assert the need for um, metrics or measures evaluating the actual process. Uh, how well was it done? And we heard a little bit before about um, the metrics uh, on language diversity and biological diversity. And one of the speakers suggested that we should also consider exploring the topics such as food diversity and biodiversity, or for, uh, for example, religious diversity. Okay, another theme was cultural and ecological restoration. So several of the speakers mentioned that cultural and ecological restoration needs to go hand in hand. One speaker, uh, for example, mentioned that the priority is to conserve the way of life, not only individual species. So one of the recommendations that was uh, put forward was to assert the importance of cultural and ecological restoration conducted in tandem in support uh, of indigenous and local community life ways. An example indicator was reintroduction of culturally important species, for example, the buffalo was mentioned, in tandem with the restoration of cultural societies to support cultural identity. Language. Okay, so we heard a lot this morning about language, the importance about language, and this came up in our session too. Uh, speakers pointed out that traditional languages are helpful to contextualize and understand the links between nature and culture. And indigenous and local knowledge are situated in the traditional customary lands and are rooted in cultural identity. So it was put forward uh, as such, as a, also as a valuable tool uh, for discussing and identifying values, priorities, and strategies within the communities, especially in conversation with elders. Uh, so some of the recommended actions were affirm the importance of language as a key means to understand the links between biological and cultural diversity. This one is pretty uh, agreed upon. And then example indicators, knowledge, use, and restoration of tra traditional place names. That's one example. This is also another theme that came up that I've heard not just in the <coughs> session but through the three days of the conference. Um, speakers noted the critical role of youth and creating safe spaces for both intergenerational healing and transfer of knowledge. Um, this includes uh, practical learning grounded in place, culture, and identity in oral history. And for example, some of the examples that were mentioned uh, was place-based activities such as youth and elder camps, uh, fishing camps, uh, canoe trips that can create an interface for intergenerational discussions and learning. Uh, and it was also highlighted that the federal education system that is being imposed on indigenous culture is not always successful in transferring cultural values or stewardship of the land, while communities have their own systems of education that should be respected and supported. This was reflected in the recommendations uh, for action points, and um, which included to promote culture-based educational pathways, including opportunities for language and culture-based learning, place-based learning, and learning opportunities out in nature. Um, Supporting systems of education rooted in cultural place based, place and identity, and also support uh, future action, including legislative solutions for culture based teacher certification programs. Um, speakers talked about getting in the, the right individuals into the schools and then work with them to get them the training that's required to become teachers. And having the teachers there to can talk about identity, talk about culture, and pass that on to the youth. Um, now some of the example indicators were the presence of young people societies and the presence of pathways for elders to share and exchange information across generations. This was another big one that was kind of difficult <laughs> to um, summarize and put down in a few key points because it was a red theme that went through a lot uh, um, of, the, of the topics in the discussion. The issue of process. Uh, it was highlighted as a fundamental for bringing actors together and for linking different knowledge systems. Some of the key issues that were identified include different ways of knowing and creating an ethical space for co-development, co-validation processes, and emerging creativity. And another thing that was highlighted that it was a need for capacity building and also guides for researchers and non-indigenous institutions and organizations 
to um, work on how to work with communities, kind of bridge that um, discomfort that sometimes exists. And so, so the recommendations included supporting creation of decision-making bodies that include representatives from different knowledge systems. Um, recognize the importance of meaningful dialogue and being uh, aware of the time and the resources that are required to actually support long-term relationships that are built on trust, transparency, and accountability. Time was the thing, an issue that came up over and over again. It just requires time and, and flexibility in time. Uh, and then also to provide a capacity building and guides for researchers and institutions. Uh, specifically also in terms of listening. Listening was a key uh, issue that came up. And participating in ceremonies, uh, participating in co-design and co-conducting co of research. Spirituality. And one of the speakers, this was quite interesting, highlighted the importance of na native religion for indigenous worldviews in thinking about nature and culture, and the impacts that this has for ecological understanding and the love for Earth, which sometimes has been compromised or, uh, with the imposition of Christian religion. Um, so the recommendations there would be to recognize the importance of spirituality and religion as a critical and inseparable component of linked to biological diversity. And also to recognize the importance of identifying the spiritual contributions and benefits that result from the interactions between people and the land. Uh, an example indicators is the trends in reclaiming and restoring spiritual, spiritual terms of reverence, for instance, and recognizing negative connotations and interpretations imposed by colonial powers. We heard this example earlier in the week too. Uh, and the presence and applications of traditional spiritual religion religious societies. Um, so here is it. So I gave you some of the examples that were kind of related to the topics that we touched. Um, but we have oh, actually a lot of examples of indicators that came up. Um, I'm not sure. I think maybe how we could share them is through a portal if somebody's interested into seeing them or how we can share John. And we can share if we want to share the full list of indicators uh, for those who are interested. Yeah. We have a web page prepared, so that anyone who's willing to share anything can send it to us, the secretariat, Murray Lynn or Mike and me, and we can post it on the web page. Okay, great. Okay, so that will, this list will be made available if somebody wants to uh, take a closer look at them. So this is a brief summary, and if we have time, I would like to open up the floor for some of the participants in the session, if they want to add anything, if there's anything that they feel that was key that I haven't mentioned, or if they want to um, uh, elaborate on something. Thank you. Thank you for your baby for keeping still for your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now we're going to, I'm going to ask, uh, I, yeah, I, I have no firm views on what order we're going to present. Well, the same stream. So, yeah. Oh, same stream. Oh, please. Perfect. Afternoon session. Cool. This is the afternoon uh, session uh, from the same stream. My name is Ayu Guala from the University of Helsinki. Uh, I live on the other side of the Atlantic in Finland. Uh, yes, I was asked to chair this, this session, which is on uh, livelihoods, health and well-being, food sovereignty, and relationships among culture, economy, and ecology. And I will not take more time, seeing that we're probably running out, but I'll just introduce who the speakers were, who the panelists were before handing over to uh, the fellow participants and speakers in the session. The rapporteurs were Cheryl, so I'd already like to thank very much Cheryl who took all the notes and passed them on to this team who's been working through the night, I understood. 
Um, but our speakers in, in the session, the panelists who had already been invited to prepare a, a presentation were uh, Janelle Baker from Athabasca University, Daisy Frank here next to me from Cultural Conservancy, Sarah Moritz from McGill University, Neil Patterson from the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, SUNY ESF, uh, Rodney Mark from Social and Cultural Development Department of the Cree Nation Government, um, and his work was presented by Colin Scott from McGill University in Sakata. And uh, some overarching questions that our session aimed to address were what roles do different management strategies, be they of water, fisheries, or fire management, play in securing local well-being and mitigating effects of climate change? How can traditional livelihood activities, such as hunting, fishing, and trapping, be maintained as an occupation in contexts of modern economy and acculturation? To what extent are traditional diets and notions of health and well-being valued and maintained also in younger generations in the face of modern acculturation? What are the implications for the social status of traditional hunters and fishers relative to entrepreneurs and wage earners whose household incomes have outstripped those of hunters and fishers? And what rights do outsiders have to give value to and often discount <coughs> harvesting sites or territories or even well-being for that matter on Indigenous people's behalf? But I shall pass on the words to my colleagues here. Thanks. Hello, thank you. Um, so we also want to open up this um, space and this uh, discussion right now first, aligned with, with our own protocol of opening up with, with a song. Um, so my sister Takaya here is, is going to share that and, and lead that, and then we'll go into the recommendations. Hello, uh, my name is Takaya Bellini. I'm from the Amman Nation um, on the West Coast. Uh, my people, the Slyman people, are our village name is Tishosan, and it means place of the spawning herring. Um, our herring population has been severely impacted by commercial fisheries, um, by dams, by the colonial um, intrusion and, and reshaping of our of our lands and waterways. Uh, so. Our discussion about food sovereignty um, hit home because I, I, I thought about our herring. Uh, I also thought about our salmon. Um, our salmon have been severely impacted by fish farms, um, open net uh, farming of Atlantic salmon who are diseased and uh, their diseases uh, latch on to our indigenous salmon populations. Uh, poison them, uh, poison everything that depends on them. Uh, they are a keystone species, they're also a very culturally keystone species, so uh, as a result they're poisoning us. Uh, so when we talk about food sovereignty, it's, it's about um, the right to, to have access to our traditional foods um, and, and not worry about health repercussions. Um, to be able to sustain ourselves in the land and have that intimate relationship of, of uh, you know, interdependence on, on, our, on our waterways, on our territories, um, without being restricted. Um, and within the context of talking about biological diversity, uh, biological diversity is enhanced by cultural diversity, but cultural diversity can't take place unless we're able to to uh, eat what our ancestors ate and feed ourselves off of our own land. So I would like to open this up with a song, a Grease Trail song. Um, this uh, Grease Trail was a trading route along our, along our coast, and we would trade Uluk in Greece, Klana, and uh, we call it um, our liquid gold because it is so precious on our coast. And, uh, it's an important part of food sovereignty, the ability to move. We weren't a stagnant people traditionally. We, we moved seasonally, we moved to different village sites. And um, it, it's, an important, it's an important song to me because the, for the Slyman peoples, a lot, of our, a lot of our songs were lost. But that is a song that's shared with other nations, our surrounding nations on the, on the coast. Um, and, and I... I love it because it is old. It's something that my my um, my ancestors sang when you know in relationship with with other nation, other nations moving through our territory free, freely. Uh, so here it is.
space in a good way, in an honorable way, that honors um, uh, all people of, the, of, the, of Turtle Island, but also your peoples and, and uh, Mohawk peoples in Ganawage. And so I'm going to hand it over uh, to my brother here who will uh, begin our official statement from our group. And before doing so, I also want to acknowledge it was more than just us three up here to create this statement. Um, and we have many of our, our friends and brothers and indigenous brothers in the crowd as well that helped us. So thank you for that as well. What can you do? Segus Kanagoa, Tad Katinius Bushu Dadats, Rakskareva Gay Nivagi Teroda, Danu Kanawa Gay Nigit. So uh, I just said, hello everybody, welcome. Uh, I hope you are at peace. Uh, my name is Dad Continuous Bush, and I'm from Ganawage, and I am Bear Clan. Uh, I don't really care much for standing behind the podium. I prefer to see all your faces and for you to be able to see me. Uh, so I want to kind of start with, uh, before I, we do our official statement, I kind of want to start with a little, uh, a little forward about me. Um, from the time I was 7 to 14 years old, I was uh, sexually abused by my older brother. And when I came out about it to my family, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a show. It was, it was bad. Um, they did believe me. A lot, everybody in my family believed me, but uh, they kicked him out of the house. He moved out and everything. But he was invited back to uh, family dinners and, and you know, so, uh, family events and Christmas dinners and this and that. And when I would freak out and or get upset and like, why is he here? He can't be here. I'm not comfortable. Uh, I, w I was always told to get over it. It's you know it's done now. You know what's in the past is in the past. Just just how come you can't get over it? Uh, and that was a lot for a 14 year old to, to be told to get over it. Uh, so for uh, three or two, 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 three years, uh, I, I suffered that, that, that reality in my house. Um, and I made a decision one day that that wasn't an environment that I could do any healing in. And so one day I grabbed uh, uh, a handful of clothes and put it in my backpack and walked out the front door and uh, I haven't looked back. Well, now I'm uh, good with my family again, but at the time I walked out the front door and didn't look back for two years and I didn't speak to my family. Uh, I have six brothers and sisters, uh, my mother and father, I didn't speak to anybody for two years. Uh, now in that two years, I lived in Ontario working at a theater. I moved to Sherbrooke where I was studying Sejip, uh, studying in Sejip. Uh, and then I was in Prince Edward Island uh, doing theater again. But when I was in Sejip, I was studying super hard. I was studying pure and applied sciences. Um, and I made Dean's List both semesters. And it was really difficult for me because I had all these super amazing grades. I had 97s, 99s. I had no grade under an 88. Um, and there was some kids from the Gas Bay area who uh, also made the Dean's List. And so at the school, we have an Aboriginal Student Association. And they decided to throw us a little dinner. It was a little nothing dinner. It was just a small little, just to say congratulations to the students, uh, the Aboriginal students who had made, uh, made it onto the Dean's List. And uh, one of these kids, their parents flew down from the Gas Bay area, both their parents. You know, and it, 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 I, I saw this during the, 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 the supper and it really made me like cry because it's like, you know, it was, it was a little nothing dinner, you know, but their parents thought it was that important that they needed to be there where they both flew out. Um, and I started, uh, I started, uh, my mental health started deteriorate, deteriorating because I had no one there to tell me good job or just, you know, like keep, keep up the good work or even just give me a hug. Um, and I just, uh, I, I've been suffering with uh, mental health for, for, for a couple of years now because of all this, but I am on a really, really well uh, uh, healing journey. And 
Um, one thing I want to say is that we need to start focusing more on, on mental health, really, especially with young, young men and young boys, because there's a stigma surrounded that uh, young men and young boys aren't allowed to feel certain emotions or, or emotions at all. They're not allowed to be humans. They have to be the strong Indian man they are. They have to, and I think that's true for all cultures around the world, that the men are always seen to be strong or have to be the, the, the rocks, um, and they're not allowed to be emotional. So uh, I just want to leave you guys with that, and thank you so much for, uh, for having me up here to, to speak. It is necessary to provide a, uh, an appropriate context about the uh, about both the sense of urgency behind our recommendation, as well as sharing uh, the what, why, and how uh, regarding the uh, recommendations we are putting forward. Uh, additionally, it is important to also know that violence is deeply rooted in the, the English language, and these recommendations do not fully grasp the, the philosophies, cosmologies, and perspectives and realities of indigenous peoples, uh, who steward over 80% of world's biodiversity. Uh, in the first North American bio, uh, dialogue on biocultural diversity, we are tasked with identifying the linkage, uh, linkages between biological and cultural diversity, which will, then, we, uh, which will then be put forward into a declaration. We believe that is more, is more than just linkages, rather than both biological and cultural diversity are, in, are interdependent and both rely on and inform one another. And I can't stress that enough. Um, while thematic streams allow us, uh, thematic streams allow us to uh, dive deeper into set issues, uh, it also reinforces a disconnect and colonial approach to uh, to understanding each issue, including including value and divided, control and conquer indigenous peoples. When we understand, discuss, and address these issues, particularly, we must simultaneously take a fine scale and broad scale approach uh, and avoid operating in silos. Uh, we must both be like the eagle who flies over and sees the entire landscape and also views and experiences the issues on the ground, like the living micro uh, microorganisms in our soils. To adequately and thoroughly discuss this topic of livelihood, health, and well-being, oh, it must be understood that the discussion around instruments of change have emerged because oppressive and colonial systems are unsustainable and have been intentionally designed to suppress our access to land, territories, and natural resources. The lack of access to our lands impacts how we steward our lands, territories, and natural resources to cultivate and use our traditional food and medicines. Validating colonial and suppressive um, approaches to con controlling our traditional food systems and ultimately our well-being has forced unhealthy, subsidized, and commodified foods on indigenous peoples, which has had devastating impacts on our physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health, and well-being. It is imperative that we recognize and acknowledge that these political, so social, and economic factors and barriers continue to disrupt our livelihoods, health, and well-being. As a result of these factors, indigenous peoples face unique health disparities, including high rates of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. While indigenous peoples' livelihoods, health, and well-being ex experience devastating health impacts, indigenous peoples also face emotional, mental, and spiritual impacts, too. Our indigenous youth experience the highest rates of suicide and depression because we have to navigate two worlds and are trying to shift from a state of surviving to thriving. That. So that's some of the context for what we're sharing as far as our recommendations, and we have six of them. The first one is respecting sovereignty and customary land tenure of each nation, ensuring natural law, indigenous leadership, and indigenous governance systems are recognized and implemented. Additionally, representation and participation of indigenous peoples are included and sought out by decision makers and any institutions related to bio diversity. Member states, governments, and all decision makers and their institutions respect, honor, support, 
and provide resources for the implementation of customary land tenure that is specific to that geographic base and are led by the appropriate peoples of that place. Our third recommendation is that free, prior, and informed consent is a regular best practice and part of formal protocol around any form of development that directly or indirectly impacts indigenous peoples, local communities, and communities of color. Additionally, free prior informed consent is used as a tool and practice for mitigating the potential threat of genetically modified technologies as it relates to traditional foods and traditional food systems. Fourthly, if indigenous peoples choose to work with external governments, agencies, NGOs, and other key stakeholders, co-stewardship that centers and prioritizes indigenous peoples and their self-determined application of traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge systems can be a suitable practice in taking care of our lands, territories, and natural resources. Our fifth recommendation is that we call for the respect for spiritual responsibility, otherwise translated into the Western understanding of rights, otherwise affirmed in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And our last point is that we um, recommend the restoration of the traditional mobilization of indigenous peoples in their efforts to protect and sustain their traditional foods, diets, and life ways. Member states and other key stakeholders should support the movement of indigenous peoples and their food and life sources as foreign borders disrupt the biodiversity of any region. This includes abolishing border imperialism that disables traditional trade routes and the mobilization of our animal, relatives, and wildlife. In the face of climate change, we must address both the present and future risks including but not limited to flooding, droughts, loss of biodiversity, deforestation, pollution and toxic runoff of inland border displacements of populations and the, risking, and the rising risk of facing discrimination due to political, economic and social barriers of both rural and urban indigenous peoples and people of color. Thank you, those are our recommendations for the day. Helpful presentation. Uh, next, I'll invite Charles. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Ellen, uh, Ellie, you and I, I guess, will go after Charles. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Nation. I have an opportunity and an honor to share with you comments from the section on communications. <clears throat> but first, I want to say a little bit about this emblem created by Barry Bolton from Kakaba. This is Kakaba, are people on the outer edge, on the, on the seaward. We always face seaward. You won't find our villages at the head of inlets or tucked in behind coves. They're right out there in the open. Our youth like to call it on the extreme. This is a standing wave, wave coming ashore, representing, talking about that aspect. In the middle is Bilha, Abalone. But you'll note something about that. We placed within that, that the Abalone, the inquiring eye of the Gamsiwa, people who came from away, drifted up on our shores. Because the message is that the people should stand on the shore with our Samoyeg at Saban, and Tsebasa, and Hail, with the people in our communities, not on the decks of the ships of the capitalist venture, venture capitalist firms that arrived on our shores. Do not stand on the deck with James Colonnette trying to explore and understand and discover, but rather to invert that image. To recognize that you need to stand with us. 
to root your knowledge and understanding in our theoretical traditions within the way in which we have defined the, the, the what it is merits of study. But keep in mind there is not a unitary singular view. It's always exciting and interesting for me to hear that this world is based on the back of a turtle. Where I come from, we know about how Raven divided our world from twilight into day and night and brought fire and power to the people, in fact made us people. So we share commonalities, but we have differences. We have th and those, the people who come from afar, need to recognize and understand and respect those differences. In this way, to see the four clans of our people, Gispiwada, Blackfish, Lesquite, Eagle, Kanata, Raven, Lakibu, Wolf, the four clans of the people that we all belong to, and then because we are on one level marine people, but we take from the land as well. But you see here the importance of the black, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, the spring salmon. I know some people call them kings or taiis or chinook. Uh, there's a, a Somaliac word for, for this, but in English we use the word spring because they come in the spring. That's the first fish that are turning up. Right around the time of can come, they, they're very closely connected. You heard of a story and account about Ulupin earlier. And then we have halibut and herring. The people who studied our, 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 our communities used to call us the people of the salmon, and salmon is important to us. But you also find we eat a lot of herring, and we heard that herring mentioned also. Herring is really important. The fish, the roe, the eggs, halibut. Basically, for Kikatla, these three fish, the ground fish, halibut, the salmon, the herring, are three of the most important fish. I mention this because <clears throat> part of all these discussions that people are having, we heard in the preceding session before, and the and you know, I'm sure we're here, we'll hear it again, are fundamentally linked to the authority and jurisdiction of our indigenous nations. And it's only based upon that framework that we can actually move forward. Only from that basis. And the complexity for those who are steeped in the world of the unifying culture of science is that you believe that you have one model that you can do use everywhere. And while there's an element, a grain of truth in that, the reality is you have to understand the particularities of our places, our ways, our protocols. And that takes work. And part of what's been happening here over these few days, the eight days, I think, for people who began at the very beginning <clears throat> all the way through, is part of that work of learning about the particularities of our places. <clears throat> so let me share <clears throat> a summary overview of what happened. And I will apologize because I will share my rendering of what happened. It's a particular idiosyncratic one that's rooted in my way of understanding the way I've been taught by my uncles, by my university education. So it won't necessarily sound the same as to everyone who was in the room, but I hope there's enough of a reflection, and you also have the very detailed notes of the fine young person who took notes for the purses, so you can contextualize it as well. But our session was a warm and convivial gathering. We had a focus on communication technologies to advance indigenous knowledge in culturally appropriate ways. I found, having been asked to chair the meeting <clears throat> and, in a sense, drop in and try to figure out where it was going, I was pleased to, to note the way in which the presentations complemented each other in their diversity, yet they were all focused in a particular common direction. We heard about mobile applications with respect to water quality that we can pick up on our phones and use in, re in reference to the contemporary, contemporary tools that, that we have about web-enabled databases to facilitate effective policy development, about critical mapping that drew both on the strengths of the technique at the t while recognizing and acknowledging the threats and, de and, and potential pitfalls of such an approach, digital storytelling through performance, podcasts, radio, rooted in indigenous strength and knowledge. Really important, I think, that aspect, the way in which so many, oftentimes we're criticized from outside our communities that we have to be authentic. We have to be real. 
that misunderstands when people suggest the technology, we can't use a truck, we can't do a podcast, we can't use digital video, that somehow that means we are not authentic, is a misunderstanding of the reality of the worlds we all live within. And then the use of video as a tactic of indigenous authority and jurisdiction, and those are important words. The hereditary leadership where I am from always use this expression when they speak in English. Because it's words in English that quote best approximate what's being said in Somali. Authority and jurisdiction. Authority, who has the right to speak? Who can tell the history? Who can, and the jurisdiction, the extent to which that is covered, that extends, what is the range? We can't tell our cousins in Lakhalams or Metlakatla how to run their business. But we can share with them our thoughts, our opinions. We can't go down to Gitgat or Kitasu and say to them, or Kitsum Kalum, and say, we want you to do it this way. We can ask them. We can share our understanding, but we can't tell them. So understanding the extent of the jurisdiction is very important. Our discussions dove into the nuances of how to apply these various techniques. We heard concerns with media overload, load, where we're, there's so much noise, as it were, in our digital world that we can't hear the, net, the messages that we want to tell. Our el youth can't hear our, our elders because there's so much distraction, and vice versa. There's worries about information gathering, I love this expression, digital dust. In that sense, they sit there in this virtual shelf, untouched, once we say, they have so much time, energy, and money, and goodwill. We heard about, and we also, they were sharing of practical experiences where people talked about a whole variety of ways of how they worked with new and old technologies together, how to make the difference. And again, these are particular, they're based upon where you are. Woven into this was a foundational appreciation that this is all premised upon the authority and jurisdiction of a hereditary and customary indigenous governance. That's critical. And I added the word customary here because not everyone has hereditary systems. Where we're from, and no trees is also from the same area, the same commu wider community, we have hereditary systems. Other people don't have a hereditary system, and so I recognize that there are different ways within the wider indigenous world. But good work no matter the intention, we'll falter, we'll falter and stumble unless our indigenous laws are recognized and settlers to date reconcile themselves to our reality. And it's really critical. Reconciliation, which is a big key word in Canada, isn't about all of us getting together in one big happy party <clears throat> and sharing and baiting things together. No, it requires work on the part of the settler of the colonial state to actually reconcile themselves to the fact that we are here, we have always been here, and we will always remain here. And the fundamental rules are those of the ground of which we stand. And that's what reconciliation is. It's adapting your rules to our laws. With that, I want to say thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I hope that what I've shared at least resonates with some element of what was discussed and that the wider record, I look forward to seeing what will emerge out of this. Thank you. I want to thank Charles for uh, giving me some energy too. That was a really powerful presentation. And uh, it, I certainly felt that I benefited from that spiritually. It was better than a cup of coffee. So, uh, we're going, we have two more presentations, and now I'm going to briefly go to the legal stream, and Ellie will help me. Uh, Ellie was our rapporteur. And then we'd like to move to the community conservation streams to finish uh, our discussion about the streams before lunch. Uh, so let me introduce the legal stream. Uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, Ellie and I were looking after the stream called uh, In Room 2, Stream 2, Instruments of Change, Interlegalities, Indigenous Rights and Advancing Biocultural Diversity. Now, we had a fascinating discussion, and, and I was, uh, we had Madame Vasseur introduced uh, the topic, she was our first speaker, but I loved the way she actually said 
her experience at IUCN with policy and laws and everything else was, are we there yet? And she was saying each time we sit down to talk about sustainable development, there seems to be more layers of policies and laws and yet nothing has actually changed except more and more layers of laws and policies on top of it. I found that that was a very uh, interesting observation and uh, there's also the fascinating story about the invasive eucalyptus trees in Latin America advancing down the hills towards the indigenous communities and stealing all their water on the way. Uh, so we had some excellent speakers. We also talked about a new developing area of law called Earth Jurisprudence, where some countries such as New Zealand, Ecuador, Bolivia have assigned legal personalities to uh, landscape features or rivers or mountains and the traditional people speak on behalf of those features. Uh, so we also talked about these new and emerging areas of law. Of course we also talked about the UN Declaration and the need to braid and interweave uh, the many different pluralistic legal systems we live uh, under together to make some sense to people who are living on the ground. Uh, so I'm going to stop there. It was a fascinating discussion. Uh, and I know Ellie has some short notes about the main points. So thank you so much, Ellie. Thank you, John. Um, so one of the um, key things that we began in the discussion with was that Indigenous peoples live under many laws, many of which have been imposed upon them. And um, one of the key things that kept coming back and forth in these presentation, in the discussion was about language. Language is an important issue. We need to use terminology um, which avoids tipping the balance of power into a non-Indigenous framework. So terminology rather than biocultural diversity, talking about territorial integrity, protection and defence. And some terminology of laws and conventions has no meaning in indigenous languages. And we've been talking about this repeatedly during this meeting. And that can create not just a, um, a moving, think, tipping the balance of power into non-indigenous framework, but also creates cultural barriers. So looking at the language used when we're talking about interlegalities is very, very important. Another uh, key point was made that in many of the legal frameworks, indigenous peoples are referred to as stakeholders, and that's incorrect. Indigenous peoples are rights holders, and that is a key thing that we need to be make, making sure is changed in any legal frameworks. So, as um, John mentioned, um, the advisor said there are all these conventions and legal instruments, but they're not working. Why is that? And the discussion went along, well, many of these are Western constructs. We're, they're not connecting to Mother Earth, to communities on the ground. And in addition, each community is different. The values, the beliefs, the rights have to be respected when planning adaptation and protection for the future. International governments and organizations should be examining what role they play. Should they be playing supportive and broker roles not dictating what to do on a local level. And that was what most agreed in the discussions. So it's important that, and it's important that indigenous peoples understand the obligations that their governments have signed up to and hold them accountable to that. And that gives empowerment from the top down, empowerment to um, do things like um, look at, um, develop protocols for consultations to assert rights with regards to knowledge, access and benefits and including the right to say no. And um, finally, um, the role of international law which has been used as a tool for dispossession is to repair this, these past injustices. And so when it comes to braiding together indigenous law and legal systems and non-indigenous law and legal systems, can we find a new space in between the two where new laws are made using the appropriate language that both um, sides can come to understand and work together? Um, one of the key points was just because it's written down doesn't mean it's not a legal instrument. There are many different ways we can do law and legal processes. And so, as uh, John mentioned, it brings us back to language. The concept of earth jurisprudence um, gives a legal personality to landscape, and that is linked inter interlinked to language. 
So language is one of those key things when it comes to looking at instruments of change, especially with regards to laws and indigenous rights. Now, I hope that I've represented the discussions. I'm sure there are things I've missed, so if anybody who was involved in those discussions wants to add anything, please uh, let me know now. Yeah, so uh, we did talk a little bit about natural law uh, in the when we talked about the new emerging law on earth jurisprudence. Uh, uh, but also, uh, just to let you know, we will be circle, circulating uh, the, dec the, the draft one of the declaration. And if you see anything important that we're missing, uh, we're going to give people a week to work on it and send it back to us. So please identify any burning issues that are not in that draft when we circulate it. Thank you. Uh, Paulette, thank you. Thanks, Paulette. Hi, Paulette Fox, uh, Blood Tribe. Um, I was just really curious, you said language that both sides or both parties in this um, spirit of pluralistic approaches. I really liked um, the presenter this morning, Bernie, and how they created the guidelines for fishing in, in their own language. So I just wanted to make space for that as well. I think it's meaningful that when we get down to those local levels that the opportunities, especially revitalizing languages, can be uh, put into laws within their language. Well, that I think it's a very good point. And I recall when the UN Declaration was adopted in, uh, uh, in 2007, a lot of Indigenous peoples translated it into plain language and into our languages so that we understood the rights framework that had been adopted by the international system. Uh, and it's something we're continuing to do with the different standards and principles under the CBD uh, to identify Indigenous peoples that can help us uh, to turn this into Indigenous languages uh, so that people understand the obligations that governments have signed up to at the international level. So thank you. Is there some, anyone else from our group? Because I, I'm conscious we, uh, uh, we need uh, uh, probably at least 15 minutes for the community, uh, the territories of life people to present back. Uh, can you let me know who's presenting on behalf of the... Uh, thanks very much, Ellie. Thank you. Uh, can you let me know who's presenting? Thanks, Ellie. Thank you. And uh, uh, do we also have... Thora and the people who were working in the afternoon, because I think there's a nice continuity. Uh, we were able to have uh, a whole day of discussion, so maybe both streams could come up. Uh, 
This is a dangerous thing <clears throat> because it takes the ideas of personhood and applies it to nature, to a river or to a mountain. Danica can speak better to it than I can. Um, and she's the lawyer, I'm just the lowly political scientist. Um, <clears throat> but from a Nichonoth perspective, natural law comes through Isak, which is observing nature and how nature works. And if we can have an undistorted lens to uh, allow for the stimulus that we're getting from the environment to come into our inner world in an undistorted way, then our inner world will be populated with a true reflection of the external world. And understanding the patterns of Mother Nature and how Mother Nature works. I was so fascinated to hear the stories of the Inuit that were shared earlier. I thank you for sharing those, um, those stories about the Inuit laws of um, which bears to hunt and which not to and when and all the rest of it, those are so critical because that's true natural. That, that, that comes from observing nature over millennia, a millennia of observations. And Isak also speaks to our emotional state. Um, and it's important to, to experience the full range of emotions and then, and then do ceremony with those emotions. Try to not get stuck in any one. Getting stuck in happy is just as dangerous as getting stuck in sad. So we have to experience the full range of emotions. And in our morning session yesterday, we experienced the full range of emotions. And, um, and, it, and it allowed us, and actually I, I apologize because I thought when I talked with John Scott, at the beginning of the day that the conversation would just flow into the afternoon, uh, but I misunderstood. Um, so we were, actually, uh, we were actually intending to continue the conversation into the afternoon. And what I was intending to start with at that is that we had, through the morning session, we had done the hard work of, of getting unsettled and then having a meaningful conversation about how we can collaborate and create strong allyship to, to turn the ship around. Uh, we're, on this, we're still on the collision course with ecological catastrophe, and we need to be unsettled, and we need to create, from that unsettling, create powerful relationships and create family. So over lunch yesterday, Colin and I had a conversation about getting lost and wasting time. And we both shared different stories about about that and about how sometimes we have, and this is what I think I've finally come to a realization about academic um, agendas and how conferences work as opposed to indigenous knowledge systems for, for gatherings, is that we, in, in, in a, from a Western perspective, we plan out every hour of the time that we spend together. And then we decide who's going to speak in which time slot what they're going to speak about. And you have to provide your PowerPoint presentation weeks in advance. You see how that's kind of strange from like a colonial, like we're colonizing time. From in, when indigenous people get together, and this, we were like, when we, when we did the Pathway to Canada Target One and the indigenous circle of experts and we got together in different places all over the country, we didn't plan out the whole time. We, we ran down, we, we, we ran, the agenda was, this is when the sun rises, this is when the sun sets. This is high tide, this is low tide. And we called that agenda Isak, because it's respect. And we, everywhere we went, we found out, what, what is the word for respect in your language? And we named the, we named the agenda respect. And then we had meals. Meals were the other things that populated the agenda. Um, and then in between those, we had subject matters that we wished to discuss. But we were always clear that this could flow, this could just flow organically. We'd have a few people prepared to say things. So I, had, I finally realized that yesterday, why this feels so disconcerting to so many people, like um, to, to plan out in advance. Imagine our, our, some of our gatherings, if you tried to do that. <laughs> Anyway, so if we're going to work together, we've got to find a way to bring those two things, those two ways of, of um, organizing ourselves together. 
yeah, now I'm going on and on too much, and lunch is coming. Um, so, um, oh yeah, the Eastern Gate, and Albert Marshall is no longer here, is he? Okay, he, he um, read a quote out, and we'd love to get a copy of that quote, because we feel it's important enough that it should be at the, at near the beginning of the Declaration. Um, also, a summary of whatever the Mi'kmaq people, because it's the Eastern Gate, whatever they want, whatever they feel is important to share from that prophecy. The prophecy was that when, in, in, at the time of contact, when colonizers were arriving, um, the old people then at that time said, whoa, these guys are hungry, and they eat a lot, and they eat, they eat, and eat, and consume. They're insatiable, and they're even insatiable to the point of being self-destructive. Um, and the prophecy was is that one day, um, the children of the colonizers would come back to us and ask us for advice. Once we're on the precipice of total destruction, that the children of the colonizers will come, and they'll ask us for advice on how to get out of this sticky situation. And so we have to hold on to our teachings dearly. It's going to be brutal. It's going to be really hard. It's trying times. We have to hold on to those teachings of love and respect and observating nature and hold on to them regardless of what they do to us. And then when, when they're ready to come ask us, we have to embrace them with love. And we have to share the teachings. And if they listen well, we, we will get out of this mess together. And we, we had a conversation about it, and we feel that we're at that time now. And I think this first North American conference on biocultural diversity could be, could mark history of, of us having good relations that way. Um, and, you know, know who you are, be, you know, uh, know who you are, believe in yourself and be bold for the unborn future generations. That's the last thing I'll say. So for those people who, who would like to review notes that were from the first session, um, it was hard to summarize and, and I want to make sure that uh, I do justice to um, the words that were spoken, so please feel free to uh, to contact me. So dialogue continued in the territory of live session in the afternoon, and uh, we spoke about uh, the importance of indigenous sacred sites and places as part of culture, language, identity, as part of ancestral heritage, and uh, as part of uh, importance for preserved biocultural diversity. We spoke about the importance to recognize those sites and places, to protect them, and to ensure also the transmission of knowledge linked to those sites, as well as the importance of indigenous control over those sites and places. We had four presenters, the group Wapishkus, Inu Sacred Sites Guardians, did a presentation about their project. Uh, we had Chief Gordon Plains, we had Bill Snow as well, and Caroline Debian. So I hand over to Claire to give you a short summary of the, what has been taught in the session. And I'd like to invite as well Dolores André, representative of uh, Wabeshkos, to come and uh, compliment. So again, um, it was a very busy day yesterday and then I participated in the um, in the drafting in the evening, so um, haven't fully gone through the notes and only had time to check in with the Inu this morning to highlight their, um, well, ensure that they're comfortable with, with the points that I had highlighted. So uh, again, if people did a presentation and have time to, to come and check with me, I, I would really appreciate that. So, um, so reflecting on what the Innu brought from their conversation, um, important points uh, that they relayed is uh, the need to respect all your relations. And um, they spoke very eloquently about the Innu concept of life. 
uh, being based on relations with the caribou, um, the centrality of the caribou to their way of life, and uh, Inu spirituality is so closely linked with the caribou, which is their master spirit. And the Inu nomadic lifestyle is, is based on the seasons uh, and uh, is very cyclical. Um, the importance of, of parents being with children on the land. Um, they actually shared uh, a diagram to show their circular vision of the Inu and the caribou and um, later shared a story about, uh, well I think uh, Anne-Marie spoke um, again this morning about uh, feeling the importance of of that circular um, perspective and not not feeling forced in, into a square um, world view. Uh, so when the Inu are in their sacred sites, they can feel the presence of the spirits of their ancestors, and this demonstrates that their ancestors are still alive and are communicating with them. And uh, they want to work to transmit spiritual rituals for healing and cultural awareness, including language, um, which is very important um, because community members uh, of different generations need healing and want to reconnect with their cultural identity. Uh, they spoke about the, the names um, the names of places, which has come up in some of the other sessions, uh, and that by observing the animals, the changes of the seasons and the changes on the land, the animals, the flowers along the trail, they knew how the land communicated to them, and they followed the teachings they received from the animals, the plants, and the land, and they pursued the trails that their ancestors did. So each Innu family followed trails to go towards the caribou and respected the cycle of the seasons and they would end up meeting and gathered in specific places and each family would then start to move um, to go to their hunting territories in the autumn and they would all come back together in the spring and uh, the sacred sites that were found in this study are those um, gathering places. So within the Inu way of living on the land, they, um, there was an existing respectful management approach that was based on immediate needs and you took only what you needed, um, the medicines, the foods, and this was a very harmonious approach that respected the lands, the waters, the air, the animals, the plants, everything, uh, and the importance of pursuing the way of life according to the Inu vision and the concept of being in a home and transmitting it to community members and future generations. So they've been working on this for five years to identify and map sacred sites, develop management plans, um, protect, uh, work towards the recognition of these places as sacred sites and to transmit the knowledge linked to those sacred sites and the circular way of life to current and future generations. And those sacred sites are history, but they are also culture and identity. They are working to build an, uh, an indigenous knowledge center for the Inu, so they can not only share the knowledge they have um, of their elders, but they can also share it with non-indigenous communities um, and peoples. So they're working in partnership with different groups at all levels, local, regional, regional and internationally. They even they did a, a trip um, to come together with the Sami peoples uh, and exchange and share knowledge and provide advice to decision makers and frontline workers. Hello, uh, my name is Bill Snow. I'm the Conservation Manager of Restoring and Coordination, Orly, Alberta, Canada, and Treaty 7. Um, I spoke about the uh, bias of the introduction uh, during the presentation, so just very briefly, three points uh, that I wanted to summarize from that. Uh, number one, the importance of ceremony. Uh, we believe that we wouldn't be able to do a lot of the work that we have done without doing the ceremonies first. So I would just encourage all of you to, in any programs that you're doing uh, within your reserve or, or territories, that to begin with those ceremonies first. Uh, number two is 
the importance of wildlife, putting them back on, on landscapes. There are certain things that we cannot do as human beings on landscapes, no matter how hard we try, no matter what kind of technology that we use, uh, no, no matter what kind of new methods may come along. Wildlife have their own place and their own purpose on landscapes. And so that's why we're so supportive of uh, an initiative like the bison introduction. And the third point that I do want to raise is that the importance of doing these uh, uh, indigenous-led research studies. Communities have to start uh, putting together these reports in their own frameworks, in their own methodologies, in their own languages, in their own processes. Uh, until we get to that point where communities are, have the skill sets and the capacity and the ability to do these studies, uh, universities are going to fill that gap. Industry, government's going to fill that gap. So uh, just really important that the importance of those kinds of studies being done by community, by elders, in, in their own processes, in their own methods. Uh, very difficult to do that right now because there's not a lot of funding or capacity for those kinds of studies. You've got to look through all kinds of programs to be able to find those. Uh, but the reward is very uh, important because that way it gives government, uh, it gives government uh, no excuse not to follow uh, how land and wildlife and resources should be managed. So, Ishniyash, thank you. So there were some other researchers um, that I can, I'll try and summarize uh, quickly. Um, so there was a recommendation from one researcher to ensure that um, we push for more options for um, Indigenous peoples to be able to choose from uh, about how they they can um, rep, um, ensure that their sacred spaces are safeguarded um, and that that's grounded in their own values and that they can be guardians um, of those places into the future. Um, Gord spoke to us about um, thinking about the next seven generations and bringing in innovative thinking and the concept of a light footprint economy and how Indigenous peoples have this knowledge and uh, they can share that with others and be a guiding light for other people to follow. And um, that comes from Indigenous people knowing what it really means to be rich and that's grounded in taking care of yourself and Mother Earth. Uh, and he spoke about his work internationally and finding a lot of commonality um, about that. Um, he also spoke, and this is a recurring theme, about um, the urgency of this work, not only stemming from the loss of, of nature around us, but also that we're losing our elders and that this is losing part of Canada. And um, that needs to be recognized and that when we're losing a language that's also losing a part of Canada. Um, and then I'll just move to the last speaker. Uh, so a very interesting study about um, looking at um, an industrialized landscape that the um, that you wouldn't necessarily think of as uh, a location that needs to be protected and, and, and evaluating that question further about um, when you have a site that has been degraded and disrupted, um, how can you still um, draw on the, the cultural values that are still there and, and in this case they were hidden underneath waters because of a dam that flooded the landscape. And in doing so, it it, um, it it flooded the the you know this this world of culture is in in some sense underwater, uh, and so they used a process of of working through that with the community and and 
which, what was referred to as reenacting a sense of place and finding the culture that was under the water and reclaiming that and and bringing it back so that it um, it could still be it could still be accessible and not only to the community but um, but putting that back on the landscape and, and making sure that those stories are, are not lost the the history of dams in Quebec is is almost it's a it's a cultural milestone it was um, the development of dams was a, a moment in, in Quebec history that's, that's tied up in all sorts of um, kind of a, a coming into the modern era for the people of Quebec and, and so that story is now at the front, forefront of these dams and, and the stories of the people um, whose lands were, were inundated um, are no longer visible and, and that it's important to, to make those visible. <laughs> Again, um, so let's just see if there's one last point. We had a very rich final discussion. Um, it, it came up again and again, the need to work together uh, and to find ways to do that respectfully. Um, I'll leave it at that. Um, I know I took a lot of time, sorry. Uh, sorry, I, I want to thank this group. Uh, 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 this was six hours of work in two streams and they worked very hard. Uh, last night I want to particularly recognise uh, our Inu friends who came and worked till midnight even though we were working in English with no translation. They were at the table giving us their views even though they were forced to work in uh, not even their indigenous language, not even in French, but in English without translation. So I want to give a particular warm thanks. <laughs> I want to share, uh, thank you for sharing both your successes and challenges on remaining on your traditional territories and maintaining your unique identities. Uh, it's been a very powerful conversation.